Oh, perfecto. It's nine o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Yeah. Buenos dias. I'm so happy to see everybody here at the Merida English Library. My name is Alfonso, and on behalf of the staff, Scott Vaughn, Carmen Minaya, and all the volunteers, we want to thank you for coming here to the library and enjoy of this amazing presentation. Today we're going to learn, discover, and enjoy, of course, of this very useful, though interesting information from an, an illustrator. He's a great artist. His work has been published everywhere, and you can find him online and on printed publications. Please, let's listen from Steven. We applaud you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, illustrator, someone who creates, but is also part of publishing. An illustrator visually expresses something to a publication, whether it's several drawings, illustration, several or one drawing, and in my case, um, I spend much of my time, much of my life, illustrating. Um, I went to college in England, in London, uh, where I studied illustration as a course. Sorry, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Very good. Um, and upon graduating, I decided I need to explore and travel and enjoy some adventure. So I said to my mum, I said, Mum, I'm going. Where are you going? <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to go to India. Where? So anyway, that, that was the beginning of it all. So what we used to call the hippie trail is something that I did many, many years ago, uh, late 60s, and a year and a half of travel in the Far East, of which I still have a few illustrations somewhere, of some temples from India and the Far. And uh, came back to England, didn't like the weather much. Uh, in fact, it rained every day I, on, on my return. I said, I've got to go somewhere sunny. So I ended up contacting some people I knew in California, and they suggested I come and visit. And that was the beginning of my journeys uh, on this side of the world. So I moved to LA, and from LA, I decided I need to see some more adventurous places. And uh, so I headed in 1973, uh, took the bus to Tijuana, and from Tijuana, I took buses and I ended up in Guatemala City, where I met a German guy who lived in my little palapa in southern India. And the two of us decided to go and find this place called Tikal. But we, in those days, in 1970, there really wasn't much of a tourist industry or buses in that sense. So we took all the back roads and we went through uh, Coban and places like that. And we finally ended up in Tikal. And it was just a wonderful experience. And then I, he went north and I went further south to Peru. And ended up in Peru and Bolivia, lived in Peru for a little while. And that was an exciting adventure. I would draw comics, and the comic was called The Chicha Robbers of Olianta, which was the town I lived in. And uh, they were published in the local Cusco newspaper. Of course, my Spanish right now has never been really fantastic, but we managed to translate everything and it worked out well. So that was an interesting day, uh, illustrated adventure. Then came back to, to America and lived in LA for a while. I worked for Hanna Barbera. You're familiar with, with the company. And I was the background artist to a lot of the Yogi Bear series. Uh, yeah. So uh, I've got a, everything that seems to suddenly become background. Temples were backgrounds. Uh, Machu Picchu, somehow there were, there were no people in my drawings. It wasn't a so somehow the background art was a big thing. So really I'm a background illustrator. Um, if anyone saw the film Being There with Peter Sellers, I actually designed the poster for the film. And I worked directly with Hal Ashby, 
because they hired a big company, and when he saw the results, he said, I hate them. And I happen to know the chap that knew him, actually, and he said, come, come, come and see him and, and see what we can do. And that's how I ended up designing the poster. In England, <clears throat> I worked on The Hobbit, the original Hobbit. I designed the backgrounds for that. And uh, so really most of the stuff I, I do is background work. This is a map moving on here, uh, <clears throat> which I put together of pretty much most of the places I have visited in my, uh, in my travels. Um, I have a few available. So we're going to move on from here. So most of the stuff I'm going to show you today are just illustrations that I haven't uh, really shown to anybody. Some have been published, many of them have not. So this really should be a bit of a treat. Uh, all to do with Quintana Roo and a little bit of Belize. So when I left Guatemala, I remember going down to Belize in the days when uh, travel was very difficult. So here we go. This is taken on the coast of uh, somewhere on the Quintana Road coast. Uh, you can see it's got no sargassum. Mm. Quick timeline of uh, the Maya periods. Now, when we're talking about Quintana Road, most of the stuff in Quintana Road is late post classic. as opposed to other parts of the Maya area, but it's pre-classic, classic, and so on. Architecture is much, much different. Now, some of the things you may see in uh, Tikal, still classic stuff there. I'm not uh, an archaeologist, I'm an illustrator. So if you have archaeological questions, I suggest you refer them to an archaeologist. So we've, in Belize, Nothing but like an adventure. So that was it. I said, let's go down by boat to the coast. So I took three days with a chap called uh, Tony. And we were literally in this canoe full of crocodiles, all our cooking gear, slept on the bank with one eye open, always. And uh, this was the beginning of some adventure on the coast there. So, we moved to a place called Placencia in Belize, and I did a fabulous place called the Ritz. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where I lived for a little while. I thought I'd do a sketch. My drawings are usually done in pencil on paper, and uh, I usually, in, in the good old days, all I had was a felt tip pen. So, I believe this could well have been done with a felt tip pen afterwards. And also, the easiest thing to carry as an illustrator is crayons. And in those days, a little bunch of crayons would be really perfect, because I could sit somewhere and color it in as best as I could. And this is a pretty good example of that. Okay. Key Corker. Anyone been to Key Corker? Lovely little spot. I think it's not sargassum free anymore. So this is just a drawing, jetties all around the little key. Um, what I would do is do a pencil line, and then I would get my pen, and I would just color it out, not color it in, but ink it in. A lot of the sketches, when they're done in pencil, unless you're using a real heavy pencil, they don't really show up. So I like to always fill them in with ink. And nobody really sees this work, so to show you. This also is in Key Corker, the main jetty. And you get there by boat. In those days, you could get a very fast boat. Now, apparently, it's a passenger boat. So, and this is early 90s. I also found that um, getting into the Maya, that there was trade was a big thing. So I wanted to include this. This is not my drawing or, or illustration, but it just shows all the different situations of trade. And if you can see all the products that would be moved around, and I found that interesting. 
None of it have very comprehensive meaning. Ah, in that group, this makes sense. So, we're going to wait for a little bit more now. And this is now in the walk. So, I've already started to take the pencil sketch and uh, <coughs> ink it in. And I'm not doing those drawing things. So, this is a good example of a uh, I'm not sure if it's really late classic, but it's got a lot of masks. And the time I arrived at this place, the masks were just covered over. So the area right there and there and there and there are all covered over and the masks are behind it. And if you go there today, apparently, they've opened up all the masks and they've reconstructed them accordingly. Uh, so. So that's an interesting thing. This is Northern Belize, and right over on the other side here is where Chetamal would lie, on the other side. So you're already in Mexico. Give you an idea of the lower coastline. <coughs> Cerros would be about there. Chetamal is there. There are various sites here. I've been I don't have all my drawings, but Oshman Park is over there. Interesting place. I have never been here. Mahafal is over here. And 307 goes north up towards Cancun. So this is the lower part. So from here, I went to several different uh, sites and did some drawings. Uh, the first site I went to was Cotton Beach. Where you can see the mask. So that's a good example of one of the masks. Pen and ink. And then there was a site, actually, this copper beach in fact. And this is another part of it. And this is a residential section of Cockle Newch, which is passed, which goes through the main area. And uh, you go up 27 stairs and you reach this plateau sort of place. And you can look all over around the place. It's really fabulous site. If you've not been there, I will suggest. And this is all in Quintana Row now. So Cockle Newch is pretty famous. They do tours there now, you could take various tours going to Kovalnich from the Chetamel, probably from Cancun these days, uh, and various other sites. I'll show you a couple more in that area. Site first by to Kovalnich is Zipanche, and this is a really fabulous site. And this is one of the temples at Zipanche. First done in pencil, then I colored it in, and this is the result. When I did this a few years ago, right up in there, in that section right there, the actual original lintels, still what the wooden lintels are still there, wow. thus Temple of the Lintels. Um, I think they've taken them down, they may have replaced them uh, at this point in time. <coughs> there is another temple there. Called Temple of Cormorants, which is around the corner from this one here. Another place you can get into fairly open, accessible to the public. And this is this is a this sort of freeze on the side. And uh, I couldn't figure out what it is, but it sort of looks like two feet to me going inwards. <laughs> I'm assuming there may be. Uh, a burial on the inside of it. Um, somebody said that there are actually flowers. I leave that up to you. But this is what we saw a few years ago. I want to thank my dear wife, Linda, over there, who accompanies me on most of these journeys. And we both couldn't really figure out what it was. If you go there today, and I do have a photograph, which unfortunately I didn't bring, but all the color is gone. So in a way, you know, praise photographers, but I, I also think that in this case, it was great to make a recording of something that no longer 
exists. And this is actually true of another drawing, which I will show later in the year, uh, of a temple that I drew many years ago that isn't there anymore. <laughs> and that happens quite a lot. So this is all at Zibanche. Then when I was down in southern Kintando Row, I came across <clears throat> I came across a, a, a chap who uh, told me about a place that I should go to called Ishkabal. Uh, but Ina weren't permitting anybody to go there. So I found out that he knew somebody who was the owner of the land. So <laughs> we managed to get to get into a site called Ishkabal, which has five massive temples. Not all of them are excavated. One is partially excavated. Um, and this is a temple, a view, a temple from the top of temple number five. And the temples all line up, and then they go around there, about two on the other side, and three on the other side. And there's five massive structures. This is the only one that's actually been uh, excavated and believes it's over that way. So you're looking south in my drawing. I like that site very much, but you can't go in. It now it's closed off altogether, forbidden to go there. Um, decided to color it in. Oh, wow. Change the clouds a bit. See the clouds in this drawing? Mm -hmm. I said, I eh, don't like that. Let's try this. <laughs> and I've been there a few times in that area, in that uh, space of time. So this is the very top of the temple. You, you can see this world. These are structures. All the stuff. It doesn't exist much anymore. The next temple that was partially excavated, I said, let's try and get up there. <coughs> And also at Ishkabal. And that is interesting because amongst all of this, I found that uh, there was something that looked like a mask. But if you go there and you don't really look closely, you'll never find it. So you've got temple number four here. To the right, you can see a little bit of temple five. All illustration. I tried to do everything on site. All the original drawings are on site. Rarely do I, I, I do take photographs, I'm not, not a photographer, but I do take photographs if I forget something and I really need to refer back to a drawing. So that, that's, that's about the extent of my uh, planning of photography. The rest of all these are, are hours spent in the glorious heat. Uh, which we all know about. And uh, another site close by, along 307, I think it's 186, sorry, that goes from Chetamal to Ascarsaga in the south, the main road there. We come across somewhere called Bagdan Bagdan. And this is along that road, another closed site. Um, this is not late classic, it's a massive pyramid. Uh, and on the day I arrived there was a chap called Dan Griffin. If anybody knows Dan, he does tours from Merida. Very nice chap. And Dan and I visited the site. And where you can see the little bit of the palafas at the very top there are where there are marks. But it was so slippery and so, and the photograph doesn't show it, but it was so rainy. I asked Dan to go up there and take a photograph. And this is one that I did draw from a photograph, I'll be honest with you. But freehand, and this is one of the masks. <coughs> and the Tower Tower. Moving right along. Going north now along 307, we went to a place called Chak Choban. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with it, this is a temple that sits upon a massive, great, big temple now. So, all this, this whole area here is there's another temple on the other side here, but this is a massive, great, big area. And somebody must have constructed this. There were stairways going up one 
one side of it. <clears throat> and I've always been fascinated by what the Maya uh, have done I mean, to this very day. I went to a site the other day and I said, how could they possibly do all this without the use of metallic tools, without the use of uh, the wheel? I mean, just amazing. Uh, always found it fascinating. Moving up the coastline a little bit. This is a map that shows you some of the sites. This is Tulum at the top. We've already left up this area here. We're moving up around here. Trio, so Felipe Carrillo is around there, the town. And along here, and along this stretch here, are a whole bunch of little tents. And, and a few more. I'll show you in a minute. So this is where we're moving up in Quintana Road, moving northwards. One of the main sites is this. It's a photograph, uh, which was taken during the Mason Spindon expedition <clears throat> from 1927. And this is Muyil, um, better known as Trinyash Che, uh, to the Maya. And this is what was taken, this is a photograph taken by them in 1927. And I went there several times with my dear wife, and I said, this is really, how would this have looked um, if, if we were to reconstruct it? And so we, I, did, I did several little sketches and drawings, and then finally I said, I've got, I've got to do an illustration of this one. So that was it. Mm -hmm. So you can see what was pretty much the remains on the left, and how I figured it may have looked. So I talked to the main people at Ina, uh, Adriana Velasquez Morlet, a well-respected person, and we had a chat about, she, she said that quite possibly yes. The only thing is, they would never have had so much blue. Now there is such a thing called Maya blue, and you should all be aware, it's sort of a turquoise light little blue. Uh, because there wouldn't be enough of the plant to make the paint. So it would have really been reversed. You would have had these areas that are red, would have been blue, and she would say, and she told me that the steps may well have been white, but the rest of it would have been bright red. Uh, as you see, if you, if you go through Maya, architecture, a lot of it was in red because cochineal or whatever the name of the actual plant is was much more available than the color blue. So, this is all the temples and this is what you've got and on the continent. There are hundreds and hundreds of little temples and uh, it's just amazing that I had the opportunity and want to thank Marsha Kirby for taking me and, and sorting out rides to these places. So we're back at Chumnashche here. That is me drawing that particular temple. <laughs> Sketching, basically. Or as I say, scribbling. So this is another small temple. It's been recovered a lot of the stuff that you see has been reconstructed uh, in, through time in the last uh, 15, 20 years. A lot of the things have been reconstructed. They've usually been just rubble. Um, but in this case, I know full well that this has been reconstructed because I've been there before when it was rubble. <laughs> okay. Kobar. Anyone been to Kobar? You should all know where that is. Big site, massive site, temples all over the place. And this is my drawing of a little area near the entrance mm -hmm. at Kobar. All freehand drawn. Love to do it. Not a computer person. <laughs> All right, moving right on. Just a, it's just a little archway by the side of the temple. So, Frederick Capital, British illustrator. The John Lloyd Stevens in 1860s, 
middle 1860s, they had two expeditions. One was um, along the coast of Quintana Roo. And Frederick Cathal would, would take something called um, a daguerreotype, what I call a daguerreotype. This is actually a camera lucida. And a camera lucida was what they would do. They would use it. It's basically a, a, a camera that you would, the lens would be focused on something, uh, like a temple, and then you could draw it onto a plate uh, because of its mechanism. So Frederick would carry around one of these, probably on the donkey, and he would use a daguerreotype, or should I say, a camera lucida, and this would be set up, and then he would draw it, so it's very, very exact. Unlike my sketches, which really are freehand, uh, these are more precise and pretty accurate. So Frederick would draw these and eventually turn them into colored lithographs. And this was a, one of the more famous ones of, uh, of Toulouse. Frederick was a tall, quiet person, is what I understand. He joined one of John Lloyd Stevens on to a book. There are books about this. Um, Incidents of Travel. Uh, there are two books and a third book, but it's a compilation with many, many of uh, Frederick Catherwood's illustrations. Uh, well worth looking at his stuff. I've always admired his work, and in fact, if it wasn't for Catherwood's work, I probably would never have heard of this part of the world. So this is the sort of thing that a camera Lucida looks like. Phil, I think you know what <laughs> Massive, great big thing. I don't think I'd be lugging one of those around the jungle, would you? No. <laughs> so anyway, this is the sort of thing that is a camera. But I think Question. Question. Yes. Was that more of a tracing then that he was doing? Was it projected onto the plate and sort of trace? Trace. Okay, like an overhead projector. A type. great word to you, right. tracing. So it's not a freehand sketch, it's tracing, but exact. And if it wasn't for the camera and cedar, we might well have been misinformed. So I'm going to give him credit for using the camera and cedar. Nowadays, I've heard that there is a camera and cedar that you can attach to your um, computer, your laptop, and you can actually draw on your laptop using the camera Lucida. Uh, I, I don't know anything more about it, so I'm not going to get into detail of that, but apparently that is something that does exist. This is, however, what I am imagining uh, Frederick would be carrying around, which I think makes much more sense. So as you can see, it's a lens, Tracing, as you mentioned, yes, but precise. So his drawings were really architecturally uh, pretty much correct. My work is really just sketches. It isn't anything to do with anything specific. I've just been a scribbler. So but we've already reached Toulon at this stage. And uh, years and years ago, you could just uh, sleep on the beach, put up a tent. And this was my first drawing. So it shows Tulum at a distance looking north from the beach at Tulum. Early 90s, nobody there, no town, one bus. Times are changing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I saw. And I, I really said, well, I'm looking forward to going to that. So we went over to the ruins there. You could actually walk into the ruins. There was no gates, no nothing. So my first real illustration is this one here, which was a sketch turned into pen and ink and a little bit of watercolor. And that's pretty much what it looked like there. It's still there. And I went again several years later on a different day. 
and did a sketch, and this is another sketch of Tulum, so maybe be careful there, out of Askia. Pretty much the same view, different drawing. Again, these drawings have not shown anybody, so you're privileged to see a few of them. <laughs> and finally, something that I did color. And that's a colored version of that very same tank. Moving right along with another temple sketch. Temple of the Frescoes at Tulum. Pencil. Again, nothing is really correct. It's a drawing, it's a sketch. Moving along here. This is in the northwest corner. The sketch turned into an illustration. There is some blue paint around the back side of there along the rim here. Okay. And now, up at the camera. So now you can see all the other I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of temples everywhere. Not open to the public necessarily. And then here's a good example of um, Small structure, small area, Lake Post Classic, um, at a place called Kalika. And this is Casa Azul. Amazing, it's still got its original color. Uh, it is now covered in a roof, it has a palapa over the top of it. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's, got, it's surrounded. Bit of a structure of columns in the very front of it. Uh, I added the palm trees because I didn't like the palm and look at it. So, along. this is an example of what it looks like. <coughs> colors are a little bit off. <coughs> I'd like to give credit to everybody who's on. Stuff. Then there are some of the other smaller temples. This is a photograph of a very small site in the Sian Khan Reserve. You have to get, take a boat to come to this place. It's all marshy, uh, mangrove swamps, in fact, covered mangrove swamps all around. The water is very clear. There are coletas all over, so you actually can take a rather an inner tube of a, a vehicle and just float down these coletas. Crystal, beautiful, well worth visiting some of these places. And they are uh, available for the public to go and visit. So this is an original photograph. I think it was taken during the Mason Spindler Expedition. And then this is my interpretation what it looks like now, or five, six years ago. And all the stuff around it, all this is mangrove, so it was all nicely cleared away. You have to take a boat into this area. And then there's another place called Chamash that I visited, also along the stretch, which is up on there. How long does it take you to do a sketch? Hours, hours. You can sit out there for hours. Right? Yes, well, ask my wife. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> grumble, grumble. <laughs> She's very good at that. She knows when it's uh, when I see something nice. Go ahead. So this is interesting because this is an archway. The rest of the rubble is all around here. It's along the peninsula that stretches uh, on, on that section of the coast. Uh, there are quite, quite a few small structures. But this is a massive arch. And this is looking westwards. Now, I don't know if you can really see clearly here, but it seems to be completely worn away here. I mean, this might be the rubble that belonged there to hold it. So while we were there, uh, uh, 
<coughs> Miguel Covarrubias Reina, <coughs> whose great friend, his great uncle was uh, Miguel Covarrubias, a uh, famous Mexican cartoonist, artist, illustrator. And I went there with Miguel, and we looked at the stuff. So I got to do a drawing of this one. And the light it was late afternoon. And we were looking at this and we were saying, you know, if nobody does anything about that, it's going to fall down in a year. So we agreed and we, I said to Miguel, get somebody to fix it. And so within two months, Miguel had gotten himself together, found the workers, found a little bit of money, got the cement, and now it is absolutely secure. So they cemented this whole area, otherwise this arch would have had fallen down. So a little small contribution there. Moving right yeah. along that same peninsula, the San Carlos Reserve, is another structure, Chinchula. Again, taken from a, a sketch. Some sketches may take less time, some may take minutes. It depends on weather, it depends on what I need to look at and visualize and say, well, I, I need that and I need that. <coughs> uh, but in this case, you can take the sketch and then you can color it in. And that's the fun part of it. it, it it's, you know, sitting in your hotel room, finding the right chair, putting the cushion underneath on the seat. <laughs> and so I did carry watercolors with me on some trips. The original trips I took were always with the taking, taking just colored pencils. Because when you're on the road with a backpack, uh, it's tough to carry paints and, and brushes and, 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 and pots for water and so on. These days, those backpacks have little wheels on them. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> so that makes it much easier. So this is one of the sites along that peninsula there. This is another one. Interesting uh, little structures. All of these are all along the coast. And inside this, even though it doesn't show it clearly, but this inside there is a massive brain column. Mm -hmm. So the structure was actually built around a brain column. It's so large, it must have happened during a very serious hurricane. So I, I thought that was a, a, an interesting little piece. And right in front of you is, of course, the Caribbean. So when you see these temples, they're, all, they're, always, they're always facing eastwards towards, uh, towards the sea. Okay. This is another one here. Also in the Sian Carlos Reserve. <coughs> As a, never really noticed it, it's got a funny little face there. Okay. And then you can get a little bit more excited when you come to a place like this. <laughs> and this is Cap Peche. Uh, Pretty rough water and locks everywhere, falling over all over, trying to keep the paper dry. This is the actual peninsula that leads you all the way up to Tulum in the north. And this is inside the watery area. And this is on the little island, it's a little island right here in the middle of nowhere. What an interesting little structure. And this gives you an idea. This is this, this is this area here where you've got all those temples I just showed you. Tulum is right up there. Um, Chunyash chain is there. Shlaipak is there. Capo uh, Chen is up there. And Wheel is slightly up there. Chunyash chain. And that's the finished illustration. Moving right along. So these are the guys. 
who are part of the invasive spin condition. If you can read down there, you will also notice that McClure, Spindon, Mason, Whitting, and Briscoe. And then it says, note the malarial expressions of Mason and Whitting. They do look like they've got something on there, do they not? Mm -hmm. So this is them on their boat. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of something here if I can. Can we get volume on this shot? Any way I can get volume on this, by the way? Oh, we can't hook it up. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'll run it again for you. But this is their boat. This is them. And this is the very first view of Tulu, 1926. Wow, wow. <laughs> Did you say 36? 26. 1926. They're going north on this boat. Really amazing for them, just for a split second to see the great wire structure there. They're going up all the way up the coast. Well, I wonder who shot that. <laughs> Just amazing. I enjoy that. Really cool. Okay. 307, main highway north to south. And this is a site called Tanka. All these sites are just incredible that I had the opportunity of visiting. And this shows you <coughs> some of the structures. The next slide I'm going to show you is actually on that side of the road. The reason I drew the line through there is just to show you how what, ha ha what happens. You know, today they're building the Maya train, and I, I hear they're going through <laughs> all sorts of stuff. And I don't want to get into the politics of it, <clears throat> but I know that there's some structures and some arcades that are being covered over by the new train. So this is an example of a road that goes right through a major site. There's a structure here that I drew, and there's a structure here, structure 12, and structure number one, which I'll show you in a moment. This is structure. 44. And there's a book all about this structure at Tanka. Now I've written the, 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 the actual word Tanka with a K, but you could write it, and I believe it should be with a C. But uh, we'll leave it at that. And then this is a close up right inside, right inside there to the right on the front back wall there is what remains. I don't know if you can see it clearly enough. Well, I suppose you can. And here we have another structure. This is a good example of what a pencil sketch would take some hours to do. Take an eraser sometimes and see if I have a problem with it. I'll just erase something and make sure that it's right. 
time of day it's also important when you're drawing because if you're up in the middle of the day you're not getting any shadows. So it's always good to draw either early in the morning or in the afternoon because you're getting that, you're getting that light. And those people that are in photography are all aware of this. And if it's straight overhead, it's not really much fun as far as I'm concerned. Here's another one over here. This is also at Tantan. And that's structure 12, the one closest to the road. In fact, 307 is right over here. And if you're going south on 307, you will see just this part of it. So I've really assumed that that certain top part is what it may have looked like. It may not be right, but I figured, you know, after studying a lot of these structures, it could well look just like that. Also facing towards the sea. Another place, in case you have heard of Akuma on the coast there, is another drawing which I turned into a final illustration. This is a little structure also facing towards the coast. Nobody's looking after these. There's no, I don't know whether Ian I have the money or not uh, to look after these, but this, this has fallen in into disrepair. And uh, I've met some people that are trying to preserve it and trying to at least put some sort of a fence around it because people are abusing it in one manner or another. But I loved it. I thought it was a wonderful little structure. And just in case it does get messed up, at least we've got some record of it. All right, so that's that good one. Now, there's a collector's shell hut. which also had some wonderful ruins, which are further inland, and that way, not right there. But this was taken before they started building, I think it's a theme park, adventure theme park or something. So this is Arthur Miller's photograph of one of the structures at Shell Hut. Uh, from 1957. This is the plan of it. Diane and Arlen Chase's version. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is my drawing. <coughs> this one is another small structure in the middle of nowhere. And this is what it looks like when you're drawing it. This is the finished drawing of a structure you saw earlier. And then Chacalau, in Roberto Aventuras' on the coast, uh, right by the Coletta there, is this wonderful little structure. Anonymous. <clears throat> and this is another structure at Tanka. This is one of our recent drawings from just a few years ago. Again, I've gotten into using Prismacolor, a particular crayon pencil, as opposed to using a watercolor. What I would do. <clears throat> the interesting thing here is for those of you who are into drawings and illustrations is that I would make a print, a G clay print of my drawing so I would have a nice crisp and a decent piece of paper, uh, black and white, and then I would take the Prismacolor pencils and then I would colour them and that was pretty much a style that I just adopted and I love it, I like the way the colours come out and uh, this is one example of one of the four temples there <coughs> at Tanka. And that pretty much, and here's one more, but this pretty much finishes our little chat. 
That's the website you can see a lot more drawings of. The image here is also at uh, uh, this one is at fire.carmen, if you will be the fire. Uh, there is a area to the south, a residential area. Uh, I think you need a pass to get in there, or you should know someone if you do. And there is a whole bunch of these little templates. So I'm doing the same technique here. I'll take the drawing, make a G-clay print out of it, bring it back to the studio, and try and cover it in with Prismacolor pencils. And that pretty much is it. Note cards are available. I have a couple of note cards here, if anybody is interested. Uh, set, uh, two sets of them. I would like to see if anyone can find those. And that's it. And I hope you enjoyed today's show. I just went to Toronto in the Yucatan, right? That makes me want to travel around the Yucatan. So thank you very much for your amazing presentations. We really enjoyed your talk and your illustrations. Yeah. I would like to share as well that the library is open from Monday to Saturday from 9 to 1 p.m. In the afternoon, we're opening on Wednesdays and Fridays from 4 to 7. And on Mondays, we're having back at the library Conversaciones con Amigos, where you can come and practice your Spanish and have others to practice your English. And as well, let me invite you. Uh, I would like you to, uh, well, you can learn that at the library we're selling now ice cream. If you're enjoying the heat, yes. <laughs> If you're enjoying the heat, we are selling ice cream here at the library, different flavors, it's absolutely delicious. And we're having different events during the month of May and June. Yes, Miss, Miss Karina is over there here with delicious ice creams, yes. <laughs> Nutella, chocolate chips, vanilla, strawberry, different flavors that are just delicious. I also would like you to meet uh, Carlos Rosado. He comes from Yucatan, uh, Yucatan today, Yucatan Legacy, and he will tell us everything about his work. Please, a big applause to Carlos. Hi guys, I'm not going to tell you everything about my work, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. Uh, some of you already know me, I'm Carlo Rosello Vandergrat, I am uh, the editor at uh, Yucatan uh, Magazine, I write the Archaeology Monday column, uh, which I hope at least a few of you are familiar with. Um, before the pandemic, I was doing quite a few tours of uh, remote archaeological sites uh, here in the peninsula, but sadly we had to stop that. Uh, I've come to the decision that now is the time to, to get started again. So for our first tour, we're, we're going to be going on in late June, uh, from the 24th to the 29th, spending five nights in Quintana Roo and visiting a lot of the wonderful archaeological sites that were spoken here at this uh, wonderful presentation. We're going to be visiting Sibanche, Kinichna, Chaco Ben. We're also going to be visiting the archaeological site of Shelha, not the theme park. Uh, spending <laughs> three lovely nights at a hotel right on the lagoon in Bacalar. And then two nights at a resort in Puerto Aventuras, from where we'll be doing some kind of optional day trips uh, back and forth. So um, if anybody's interested, you could come uh, and, and speak to me or Julie or to our uh, marketing person, uh, Jesse Cabanitas, yeah. over there in the back, uh, if you want to leave your information, and I'll get in touch with you. Uh, it's going to be a really fun tour, but since this is the first tour that we're doing since after COVID, uh, the rhythm of it is going to be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more calm that, than what we've done in the past. Uh, I see some familiar faces that know that uh, some of my tours sometimes end up being like death marches. <laughs> this, this will not be that. Um, it's going to be a lot more laid back, and there's going to be plenty of time to just also enjoy the Lagoon of Bacalar, which those of you which uh, have visited know is absolutely fantastic. So uh, I invite you to join us. You can find more information on yucatanmagazine.com, or just uh, come to us. Jessica's trying to tell me something. Yes, uh, Yucatan Magazine is also uh, for sale here uh, at the Reverend English Library. We're actually in the middle of a rebranding, um, starting on issue 5, which is in print right now. Uh, we're changing our name from Yucatan at home to Yucatan Magazine, just like the website as well. But it's uh, the same publication with all the same uh, type of content you've come to expect uh, from us over the years. So again, Carlos Rosado Vandergraat. Uh, the tour is going to be from the 24th to 29th. I hope uh, a 
few of you can, can join us, and it's going to be a, a, lot, a lot of fun. All right, thanks very much. And, thank you. and as well, thank you very much for coming to the Merida English Library. We expect to see you more often here at the library. Please, you can come and sit and enjoy up the area, read some books, become a member, and if you're a member already, please join us on our different events. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yay. Thank you.